reverend clergy, ladies and gentlemen, uh, sisters and brothers in Christ our Lord, and children of Mary, Mother of God. Thank you for this generous invitation. It has been a great privilege to join your prayers this morning, particularly your devotion towards the Lady of Walsingham. I shall attempt to contribute to this prayerful and welcoming ambience by introducing you to aspects pertaining to the Marian devotion of the Orthodox Church of Byzantine tradition. By the way, uh, feel free to interrupt me if you don't understand something that I say. I'm happy to clarify. <coughs> to illustrate Orthodox Mariology, or rather theotecology, as we call it, um, from St. Mary's most common attribute in the Byzantine Greek, Theotokos, the one who has given birth to God. I have chosen the festival of the entry of the Theotokos in the temple, celebrated every year on the 21st of November. The origins of this festival are lost in the haze of history. It must have originated in the great age of Byzantine theotecology, namely in the 6th to the 8th century. It is then that, after the ecumenical articulation of the faith in Christ as true God incarnate of the Virgin Mother, the Byzantines have realized that the mystery of the Lord's incarnation can be revered both directly in Christological festivals and indirectly by way of celebrations dedicated to his mother. Although various forms of Marian devotion existed far earlier in Christian history, it is during those centuries that most Byzantine Marian festivals have been established. This is evidenced by the abundance of theotocological hagiographies and homilies in the 6th to the 8th century. Of particular interest are the recently discovered Life of the Virgin, written by St. Maximus the Confessor, uh, it has been uh, actually uh, edited and uh, translated into English quite a few years ago. Possibly at the end of the 6th or in the, the early 7th century. And the homilies produced by reputable Byzantine preachers such as St. John Damascene, St. Andrew of Crete and St. Germanus of Constantinople in the 8th century. Particularly, the Byzantine homilies of the 8th century signaled the emergence of a plethora of Marian festivals, both major and minor, of which the former are considered of equal importance to the festivals dedicated to the Lord. One such major theotocological celebration is the entry of the Virgin in the Temple of Interest here. I want to pause here and uh, uh, add something that I haven't written or put in writing in my paper uh, about the role of uh, the Theotokos, or if you like, the reports between uh, Mary and Christ. In um, uh, the Orthodox tradition of Byzantine background, because there are a few kinds of Orthodoxy perhaps, you know, um, most uh, expressions of Marian devotion uh, are very Christ-centered, uh, including in, uh, in the iconography uh, of Mary, uh, we always represent her um, together with Christ somehow. Um, she's always uh, contemplated, if you like, um, together with her son, our Lord, um, and as a pointer to him. Uh, this can be taken um, somehow, or maybe in some quarters, as uh, something of an obstacle towards uh, affirming or acknowledging uh, Mary and her importance, always pointing somewhere else to her son. But I believe that in theological terms, it makes sense given that uh, although she's the mother, she's not in charge. Sorry for my trivial way of putting it. Um, and we uh, are appointed by 
uh, her posture in the, uh, in the icons uh, or in hymnography, we are pointed by her towards her son. And as a matter of fact, one of the most uh, uh, common orthodox representations of, of Mary is called Odigitria, uh, the one that points uh, the way towards the son. Uh, usually, um, she's holding Christ as an infant, you know, um, in her uh, uh, left arm, and she points towards him uh, with her right. Uh, she's the more impressive figure in that iconographical composition, of course, but she points towards the humble Lord. Uh, so, this is typical for um, uh, the Orthodox, uh, Orthodox Byzantine understanding of, of Mary. She's always considered together uh, with Christ. Uh, or if you allow me to put it this way, she is an icon of Christ. Um, and I think this is, again, something that uh, deserves uh, a bit of explanation. In um, Orthodox uh, iconography, um, the paintings, we don't use statues, the paintings uh, are never the final object of our veneration. Uh, they are like windows, or again pointers. This has to do with a certain understanding of, of the symbol, what a symbol is. Uh, in the Orthodox tradition of Byzantine background, the symbol isn't something that uh, just signifies something. It is a signifier that puts you in touch with the reality to which it points. So you look at, uh, at the icon of Mary and uh, whether she's typically represented together with Christ somehow or on her own because there are such representations too. Uh, she's always a pointer towards Christ and this is the case with the uh, um, with most uh, icons, if not all Byzantine icons, uh, they are considered as windows towards uh, Christ. This is uh, something that I, I believe uh, can help you make sense of uh, why I say uh, that the festivals of Mary are always connected with uh, the Lord. And uh, this is... Uh, um, an aspect that uh, that should be taken on board because otherwise you'll not understand for instance why when i present this particular festival called the 21st of november which has to do with the moment in the life of mary that chronologically has nothing to do with the lord yeah. if we look at it from from a distance uh, but it, it is still christ-centered In what follows, I approach this festival in three stages. First of all, I consider in brief the outward dimension, namely the apocryphal information that the Virgin Lady entered in the Temple of Jerusalem, where she spent a number of years in the Holy of Holies, as reiterated by the Byzantine hymnography of the festival. I shall point out that the festal hymns already suggest an ecclesial interiorization or appropriation, if you like, of the story. Second, I consider the same liturgical framework which, alongside maintaining the outlines of the apocryphal story, introduces a tension in that it takes the narrative as a pretext to contemplate the transformation of the Virgin into the temple of the Incarnation. I identify this layer as a more profound stage in the interiorization of the festival. Third, and finally, I show how St. Simeon the Theologian, whose repose in the Lord occurred in, uh, in 1022, that is, a generation before um, the Welsingham visions of 1061. So Simeon offers a way to further interiorize the festival by suggesting the transformation of the devout after the model of the lady's own transformation. So, uh, Put, um, I identify three uh, ways in which this festival has been and can be uh, appropriated, uh, made 
uh, more ecclesial, if you like, uh, more uh, relevant to the experience of God's people uh, in the here and now. The first level is that of the actual uh, hymnography or the hymns, the texts that, that have been composed by a number of Byzantine hymnographers. Uh, we don't know for certain when, but we assume that it was sometime in the 9th century when a, a big liturgical reform was undertaken in Constantinople. Uh, and this is when um, this uh, older festival, uh, the entry of, of Mary in the temple, uh, received uh, a, a richness of, of hymns. Uh, many have been composed, as I said, in the 9th century uh, to celebrate the hymn. But what these hymns do, and this is uh, what I'll try to uh, say in the first place, uh, what these hymns do is to take that story about uh, Mary's infancy and to transform it into something that is um, an exemplary story, if you like, something that is relevant to the church. Um, then the second level is uh, again embedded in, in, in that same hymnography uh, where the story, the, the outward story, if you like, of Mary being presented to the temple um, is transformed, sublimated, and it, uh, it actually uh, supersedes the original story. And the narrative that is presented in this sec second layer um, is about Mary becoming a temple, which is far more important uh, in terms of our Christian devotion. And as I said, in uh, the Orthodox uh, uh, tradition, Mary is always connected uh, with the mystery of Christ, the mystery of the Incarnation, particularly. And uh, of course, the, the third one is something that hasn't happened, not liturgically, uh, but it can happen in, in uh, our everyday experience as Christians uh, and we are led uh, towards that kind of experience or at least that understanding by a mystic uh, of the 11th century, or early 11th century. <clears throat> the first layer of uh, interiorization, an apocryphal narrative and its ecclesial appropriation. The hymns for the Festal Vespers, Matins and Liturgy, the Mass, are contained in the Mineon for November. Mineon uh, is a Byzantine liturgical book destined for the use of, of the chanters. The hymns address various aspects of the festival, operating like an implicit catechetical introduction to the mystery of the Virgin Lady. Here is a sample from the service of Matins. I quote, The one who nourishes our life, the offspring of the just Joachim and Anna, the parents, now bodily an infant, is offered to God today in the sacred temple. She was blessed therein by the holy Zacharias. Let us all proclaim with faith that she is blessed, for she is the mother of our Lord. End of quote. The message of the hymn is straightforward. Saint Mary was dedicated to God as an infant and brought to Jerusalem where she received the blessing of the high priest in temple. The text recapitulates aspects of the early life of Mary as presented in the second century apocryphal, the Gospel of James. Of particular interest are sections seven and eight from that gospel, which describe how the parents of the lady, Joachim and Anna, offer her to God at the age of three, and how, after being led to the temple in procession, she spent there in the Holy of Holies the next nine years of her life until the priestly conclave decided to entrust her to the protection of righteous Joseph. <coughs> the entire festal hymnography for the 21st of November rehearses the same story. Uh, of course, uh, historically speaking, this is uh, very untrustworthy and information. In, 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 in the Jewish ritual uh, of the time, uh, only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies once a year. Uh, so it's an apocryphal information, but there you go. Uh, it's uh, conveyed to us by way of a, a, a mid second century text. And um, somehow, although this text, the, the so-called Gospel of James has never been part of the canon, um, 
the Byzantine Church um, has appreciated part of, of, of this, uh, this gospel and uh, uh, incorporated uh, various aspects uh, to its hymnography. That said, I have selected the above hymn given that it adds to the apocryphal narrative two new elements, namely the recognition of Mary as mother who nourishes our life, in other words, mother of the church, God's people, and the exhortation to the latter, God's people that is, to confess the blessedness of Mary as mother of the Lord. These details are of crucial significance since they already point to a festal in theorization of the apocryphal narrative. More specifically, irrespective of the accuracy or rather inaccuracy of uh, this account, God's people have a certain way of appropriating the story as having to do with the relationship between Mary and the Ecclesia. However, despite the obvious attempt of the Byzantine hymnographer to appropriate the narrative by interiorizing it as an ecclesial event, most Orthodox take the story as true account and believe in its literal meaning. Their assumption is under, uh, uh, entertained by the Synaxarion, or the summary of the festival read during Matins, whose message is reproduced with slight variations throughout the World Wide Web. That said, deeper than the first level of interiorization, the festal offices encode another layer of meaning, and the second layer, Mary as Temple of the Incarnation. Already in the 8th century, and in a homily on this festival, St. Germanus of Constantinople asserted that, I quote, Today she enters the temple of the law, at the age of three, she who alone will be dedicated and called the spotless and highest temple of the Lord." End of quote. The homilist highlighted two meanings. The first layer refers to the apocryphal narrative that serves as a pretext for the festival, whereas the second one points to the transformation of Mary into a temple of God, or more precisely, of the Lord's incarnation, perhaps the actual content of the festival as celebrated by the church. The latter nuance of interest here finds confirmation in the, the very order of the festal matins. The following hymns from the office rehearse the same aspects, both of them, in an expanded form. The first hymn. Today the living temple of the great king comes into the temple, so the temple comes into the temple, Mary comes to the temple, to prepare herself to become his divine dwelling, O peoples be exalted. And the second, the Savior's, Savior's most pure and immaculate temple, the very precious bridal chamber and virgin, who is the sacred treasure of the glory of God, on this day is introduced into the house of the Lord, and with herself she brings the grace of the Divine Spirit. She is extolled by the angels of God. A heavenly tabernacle is she. Both hymns highlight the two dimensions of the festival encountered in St. Germanus' homily, but in particular emphasize the mystery of the Virgin who is a living, pure and immaculate temple, ready to become a divine dwelling of the incarnate Lord. Thus, at a certain level of signification, the festival is about the experience of the Lady as Temple, the deeper message conveyed by the outer layer of the story. Alongside the obviousness of the message that the two hymns convey, there are there implicit ways in which the same meaning is promoted. For instance, that the Virgin has become the Temple of the Incarnation is suggested by the fact that precisely during this festival the Orthodox Church begins to chant a sequence of hymns known as katavasias, uh, which are dedicated to Christ's birth and in which there is no reference to the Virgin's supposed entrance in the temple. Inspired by the beginning of a Christmas homily delivered in the 4th century by St. Gregory the Theologian, also known as Nazianzus, later transformed into hymn by St. John Damascene in the 8th century, the following text is the opening item of this sequence. I quote, Christ is born, glorify him. Christ from heaven, go and meet him. Christ is on earth, arise to him. 
Sing to the Lord, all you who dwell on the earth, and in merry spirits, all you peoples, praise his birth, for he is glorified. Now, it's a strange uh, association of, of, of circumstances. You have this Christological hymn of Christmas, and this hymn is chanted from the 21st of November uh, up until, I think, almost the, the 30th of, of December. Uh, and on the other hand, you have this hymn uh, starting to be re uh, chanted uh, during a Marian festival. There's no explicit connection there, of course, but there's always that implicit connection between Mary and Christ. In being chanted in this very day, it's, uh, the hymn suggests that the Marian festival is the pretext of a more profound mystery of the Virgin who has become the temple of the Incarnation, by which she contributed to the event of salvation, the birth of Christ. A similar reference to the Lady's transformation into a divine temple is suggested by one of the readings prescribed for the liturgy from Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 to 7, which offers a description of the sacred items in the Old Testament uh, tabernacle. Granted, taken at face value, this pericope has nothing to say about the Marian festival. It's really, really a description of, of the objects in, in, in the temple. Yeah? And you have this reading um, dedicated uh, to, to a Marian festival. Why? Uh, you are enticed to make the connections, of course. Nevertheless, when connected in the sermon with the other reading from Luke chapter 10 verses 38 to 42 and chapter 11 verses uh, 27 to 28, the message becomes transparent. Saint Mary, the one praised in the last of the Lucan passages, is the tabernacle of the Incarnation. The above examples provide abundant proof that the festival celebrates Mary the Temple, not Mary's entry in the Temple. I am certain that many Orthodox when we'll read this, we'll rejoice. <laughs> Stony and <laughs> being burned at the stake, stuff like that. <laughs> the captiva captivating apocryphal narrative of the lady's infancy is re-signified within the framework of the festival, becoming the parable by which another message is proclaimed, namely, the lady's divine transformation in preparation for the incarnation and as an outcome of the Incarnation. On this note, I must turn to the third layer of interiorization by drawing on an external source to the liturgical rites, St. Simeon the New Theologian's first ethical discourse. It's about a personal dimension, if you like, of the Marian mystery. The main hymn of the festival, known as Apolitikion, already alludes to this third level of interiorization. I quote, Today is the beginning of God's good favor and the proclamation of humanity's salvation. The Virgin is presented openly in the temple of God and she announces Christ to all. Let us then with a great voice cry aloud to her, Rejoice, you are the fulfillment of the Creator's dispensation. The hymn connects the Marian festival and the mystery of Christ in that it has the Virgin announcing to the world the arrival of the Lord. Furthermore, it affirms that today we are given a foretaste of God's favor and that our salvation is inaugurated. I have to pause again. This today is very characteristic to uh, Byzantine hymnography, uh, particularly uh, the major hymns. Uh, Christmas, Resurrection, um, Holy Friday, um, uh, the Crucifixion of the Lord, but also in some uh, Marian uh, festivals, uh, you uh, uh, are stunned by the uh, repeated the repeated occurrence of this today. Uh, so you, you know, historically, uh, Christ was born uh, uh, two millennia ago, crucified two millennia ago, resurrected two millennia ago. Yet, w when you are in uh, in, in, a, in an Orthodox church, um, particularly during Matins, you hear this today uh, uh, occurring 
uh, again and again and again. Today it happens. Today it, uh, he is born. Today he comes down to us, and so on and so forth. Um, and of course, uh, you, you can be stunned, but you can also be uh, uh, overwhelmed by the message because you are no less a witness. Discipleship is taken here very literally. You are not just reminiscing. You know from the gospel that this happened. Uh, when you read from the gospel uh, and being transported by hymnography, by iconography, uh, you are really transported then, illo tempore, as they say, you know, those times. Uh, and again, this is another bridge, a wormhole, if you like, connecting various uh, 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 times and, 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 and places. And you are there. You are, you are no less a disciple. You are no, uh, uh, not at all uh, disadvantaged by the fact that you live two millennia after the events. You are there today. Yeah? So this today uh, is also part of the Marian mystery. Before I turn to St. Simeon's interiorized theotokology, it is not worthy that the views he developed around the turn of the first millennium built on at least a couple of traditional antecedents. The first relevant occurrence uh, of the topic of our, of our transformation is the classical Pauline passage in Galatians chapter 2, verse 19, where one finds that the apostle was, I quote, again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed, close, uh, formed in the readers. The fact that he referred here to an experience of Christification as the 14th century Byzantine mystics and Nicholas Cavasilas uh, calls it. Uh, so this sense is inescapable. Thus St. Paul talked about a mystical intimacy with Christ, an experience which consists in the dwelling of the Lord in the believer and the latter's reconfiguration in the image of the Lord. Later, in the first half of the 7th century, St. Maximus the Confessor affirmed in his book of difficulties, known as the Ambigua, in chapter 7, that, I quote, the Logos of God, the Word of God, who is God, wills always and in all things to accomplish the mystery of his embodiment. So the incarnation took place historically two millennia ago, but the will of the same Son and Logos, Word of God, is to repeat somehow that experience in relation to each and every one of us, God's children. Here, the Pauline image of Christ taking shape within the believers, particularly the nuance of his indwelling, is straightforward likened to an incarnation or embodiment. According to St. Maximus, the Logos of God wishes to put on the flesh of all his creation, human and cosmic. At this juncture, however, St. Maximus's incarnational spirituality does not make plain what is the outcome of this universal embodiment of the Lord, always and in all things. What matters is the proposal of a repeated incarnation of God's Word on a personal, particularized level. This is where St. Simeon intervened decisively, in that he considered the content of Christification through the lens of the Theotokos, Mary. For him, and in short, the Christian experience replicates on a personal scale the experience of the Virgin who received the Lord within her womb and has become a temple of the Incarnation, a temple of God. Here is what St. Simeon had to say, and I quote, God, the Son of God, entered into the womb of the all-holy Theotokos, and taking flesh from her and becoming man, was born perfect God and perfect man. All of us who believe in the same Son of God and Son of the ever-Virgin Theotokos, Mary, in believing, receive the word concerning him faithfully into our hearts. When we confess him with our mouths, uh, all this is Pauline uh, phraseology, and repent our former lawlessness from the depths of our souls, then immediately, just as God, the word of the Father, entered into the virgin's womb, 
Even so do we receive the word in us as a kind of seed while are being taught the faith. We do not, of course, conceive him bodily as did the virgin Theotokos, but in a way which is at once spiritual and substantial. When we believe wholeheartedly and fervently repent, we conceive the word of God in our hearts like the virgin. End of quote. The above passage does not refer to the festival under consideration, but the Simeonian vision appears to have continued the process of interiorization begun with the ecclesial appropriation of the story in Gospel of James, and more so the interpretation of that story as signifying the transformation of Mary in the Temple of the Incarnation. St. Simeon contemplated the mystery of the Theotokos as exemplary for the Christian experience, and consequently used this paradigm as a key to unlock the mystery of the Christian experience. For him, and keeping the proportions, all the members of God's people are called to achieve what one could call a theotokological state, Marian state. Like Mary, all believers are called to interiorize the Word, the Logos of God, through faith and conversion, so becoming pregnant with God, as it were. In this light, the relationship between each believer and Christ is analogous to the relationship between the lady and her son. So interpreted, mystagogically, as the Byzantines would say, the Orthodox festival of the lady's entry in the temple occasions a meditation at once on Mary's mystery and the overall Christian experience in the same light of the Incarnation. The apocryphal story of the Lady's entry in the temple becomes the story of her transformation in the temple. In turn, when perceived through the lens of Mary's experience, our own life in Christ is, to say with St. Simeon, theotokological. And so, when we contemplate the mystery of Mary the Theotokos, the true temple of the Lord's incarnation, we are given an opportunity to catch a glimpse of our own spiritual journey. Thank you, uh, Father Doris. I'm uh, Father Doris. Uh, happy to take a few questions.